Well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're having a great day today, and I'm glad you could join us for our webinar titled Leveraging Your Competitive Advantage Through Automation. And we want to give a special thank you to OSE for sponsoring this webinar. I think we all know that automation is essential and that the processes before and after printing and the associated workflow tools and technology are the focus of measures to boost productivity. And this includes everything from online order entry to inserting, mailing, and fulfillment. It includes things like automating logistics systems to transport paper and pallets and take printed sheets to other processing stations or inline finishing sim systems. And so today what we're going to do is you're going to hear from two people that have done a great job at automating operations. The first is um, Bob Radzis. And Bob is the Chief Customer Officer at SG360. And the second is Peter Barzak, and Peter's the Vice President of Operations for Data Mail. Now, before we get started, what I would like to do, I'd like to do is give you a couple of tips for enjoying the webinar. First of all, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can let us know by using the Q&A box, or you can troubleshoot by clicking the Help widget. Um, the next thing is if you've got questions for the, today's speakers, what you can do is use the Q&A box, and we'll be taking those questions throughout the course of the webinar, um, so feel free to enter them at any time. Don't wait until the end of the session. And then if you want to understand what the console can do, just click on the Tips for Attendees widget for a complete rundown. Now, for our agenda today, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the case for automation and why it's so important in today's marketplace. And then you're going to hear two unique and very different perspectives about streamlining operations. The first is Bob Radzis, Chief Customer Officer at SG360, and then from Peter Barzak, who's the Vice President of Operations at Data Mail. We'll wrap up with a few recommendations and conclusions, and we'll make sure that we get to any of your questions that we might not have answered throughout the course of the webinar. Now, when you look at the concept of automation, what I tell everybody, it's about a combination of both efficiency and effectiveness. If you're dealing with digital technology, digital effectiveness is doing the right thing, and that means conducting the right activities and applying the best strategies to gain a competitive advantage. But the other thing that's of equal importance is doing the thing right, and that means that you've got to have the right processes in place that are completed with the fewest resources in the shortest possible amount of time. Now, when we look at service providers today, there's a lot of challenges that you confront on a daily basis. First of all, competition is out there. Buyers are continually demanding lower and lower prices from you, as well as higher and higher quality. They want more complex cross-media solutions. There's a huge growth in jobs coming in over the Internet. The volume of short-run work has gone up exponentially. Turnaround times are decreasing, and obviously production efficiency is everything, and that means that you've got to have the right tools and systems in place for workflow automation. On a regular basis, InfoTrends, a company I work for that does a lot of market research in the area, evaluates what's going on with run lengths. And the simple message, and this is a bit of an eye chart, is that run lengths are getting shorter and shorter. And there's a number of reasons in terms of what your customers are actually looking at. Now, what we did is we actually went out and we surveyed several hundred print service providers. And we asked them about the run lengths for the jobs that they're printing. And these, those range from uh, run lengths of the number of jobs that are between 250 and 50,000. And what you'll see is that the number of jobs that are less than 250, less than 5,000 on this chart have gone up dramatically between 2004 and 2011. Now, the other major thing that's happened is that we're also seeing a migration to print buying online. And we look at the volume of work that's going on over the Internet. And so while I've got short run lengths, a lot of that is driven by the fact that people are entering those orders via the Internet. And in fact, our projections indicate that shipments over the Internet, while well, total print shipments are relatively flat, the volume ordered over the web is going to increase at a 20% compound annual growth rate. And so what that means is 
with web-enabled customers, you've got to have the back-end processes to deal with them. We also asked service providers how they felt about automation. And we asked them on a scale of 1 to 10 to rate the current level of workflow automation um, in areas of their production operation. And the simple message was that concepts including file submission, print, pre-press, and pre-media had a satisfaction level of about 50%. When it came to things like shipping, fulfillment, and finishing, the scores were less than 40%. And so the simple message is when you ask your peers in the industry how they view automation, the message is there's a lot of room for improvement. We also asked them where some of the most persistent bottlenecks were. And it was clearly things like proofing and approval, job estimating, pre-flighting, job submission, and in fact, getting those bills out the door. One of the big challenges that service providers have had is in a lot of instances, automation is implemented in silos. And so in some instances, they may have made progress in concepts like submitting a job, but then it wasn't linked to the shop floor and pre-production processes. And while finishing technology is improved, there's a gap in streamlining getting that print into the realm of finishing. And so as you look at the marketplace today and you look at what we kind of categorize as digital nirvana, it's really a seamless integrated workflow. And that means that the service provider needs to have standardized information from all job submission points. You need to alleviate workflow bottlenecks like proofing and job estimating by digitizing them. You need to have a centralized set of tools to manage order information. And you need to leverage integration platforms or services to knock down those data silos. So what we're seeing and what you're going to hear from Bob and Peter is this movement towards super efficiency, regardless of the environment that you're supporting. And when you think about that super efficiency, what it does is it really enables your organization to become very, very cost competitive. And if I'm focusing on super efficiency and automation, it means that what I'll have is internal processes that function with rare interruptions and fewer errors. I'm in an environment where little data is rekeyed. What you've got are units and functional areas that are collaborating. The organization becomes fast and cost effective and it interacts with its stakeholders, your customers, by sharing processes across the supply chain. What I tell folks is one of the big things that you've got to take a look at is that every time somebody touches things, money is lost. Now, what I'm going to do is um, turn it over to Bob Radzis. And um, Bob's going to share with you what I categorize as a very interesting journey in terms of how they automated through lean manufacturing principles their operation. And I know Bob's been having some phone line problems. So, Bob, are you with us? I am. I am. Thank you, Bob. I am on a cell, so hopefully it's coming across okay. It's perfect, Bob. Take it away. Okay. So, uh, thank you. And, and now, Bob Radzis is part of ST360 for the last uh, almost 30 years. I, I operated RT Associates, which was a uh, we, we started out as a as a typesetting company, and uh, and uh, well, I, well, I am uh, I'm on the line here. My there we go. Okay, um, ST360 is is a you know compared to RT is a very large company. We're about uh, 350 employees. We have Eight web presses. One of our largest presses is a Sunday press that can take uh, 75 inches of, of blank paper and come all the way down in line to a to a finished piece. Um, Costco is one of our famous pieces that we produce, and and it's amazing to watch that piece come off all in a in, in a finished uh, in line process. But for the majority of my time, I spent it in in the digital world producing things on on. Well, I started out with egg for chroma presses and moved on to Kodak Nix presses, and currently we operate some OSE and HP Indigo equipment. And 
ST360 evolved from Sagerdahl Corporation, where we were a, a large web printer. Part of the reason for my acquisition is to bring more value into the print stream. But if I go back into the into the value process part of, of the RT organization, you know, when I acquired the company from my partner about uh, five years ago, I looked at, at where we were and what I needed to do to be successful. So this happened around 2008, and I was introduced into to lean manufacturing. And it, what lean manufacturing did for me as an owner, while it allowed me to become more profitable, it also developed into a full business plan. So I'm going to kind of walk you walk you through a couple of the things that we currently do. We We've got a, a large amount of, of variable data programs that we run. We, we introduce pearls and QR codes and a lot of short run printing and all, all those things work, work fine. As, as you know, the market's gotten much more competitive. And so when I looked into lean manufacturing as to how I could become more efficient, these are some of the building blocks that, that, that come into lean as the, the one piece tech time. Um, we record hourly how many impressions we're getting off of our off of our presses, and any time we fall below a certain standard that we've established, we make note of that, and that allows us to go into problem solving so that we can identify issues in our process, and it's a very quick way of of doing a problem solving exercise that we we know that, and, you know, sometimes I get ahead of myself on these presentations is that. In lean, what we do is we look at improving the process. And traditionally, before I got involved with lean, we would always go and look for the operator or the person and figure out what he did wrong and why it messed up. So it was a totally different mindset that we built into the lean. The Kanban system is, is an automated part where we it, it drives our inventory. Um, Previous to that, we used to have, uh, you know, our estimators go through and check what our house stock is by developing the, the, the Kanban systems cards tell us the ideal reorder stock, and we were actually able to bring our, our paper suppliers in part of the process and ordering these because we put our SKUs onto these cards that when we dropped them into a into the fax machine, it automatically set up the reorder. We were able to limit the amount of materials and still receive the quantity discounts because we we have brought the vendor in and made their process easier as far as the supplying. So the, the lean system standard work was doing things the same way all the time, flexibility of employees so that they were trained to work up and down a spot in, in, the, in, the, in the, the value stream. And then Kaizen is the continuous improvement that lean talks about. So, Lean, is, lean. If you look at it from a high level, is pretty pretty simple. It's uh, what are your what are your customers willing to pay for? You know, so we're I assume most of the pe people on the line are printers of, of some type, and what our clients are willing to pay for is when we're actually printing the brochure, and then all the other pieces on the right side of this chart are are non value added. Sometimes they're necessary, and most of these are, but the customer doesn't care about that. So the the better we can do it, leaning these processes out, the more cost effective that we're going to be. And you know, these, these are the, the the primary reasons why companies would like to look into lean. And I'm going to take it on a little bit of a further direction. As an owner, what lean did for me was made my job very simple because some of the pieces that that lean brings in is, is that. We empowered the employees to, to help drive the process. My, my job as the owner of RT, and now part of, part of SD360, is to provide the vision of where we need to go. And if you trust the processes of lean, what will happen is, is that the employees will tell you the how. And that, that's a, a totally different way of looking at, at building a business plan out. And if you empower the employees, the, the, they know how to do this work, and it, it, just, it just made things so much easier. Developing standard work so that things are done the same way all the time. One of, one of the things that our coach that helped us out through Lean told us is that until you have a process, 
you don't know that you have a problem because if you can't do things repetitively the same way, you can't go in and try and do a problem solving and, 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 fi and fix the issues. So as an owner, all of these things were pluses, but the, 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 the fact that I trusted the process, and, and believe me, I, I'm going through the same thing now as, as since I've been acquired by Segredal and trying to bring lean into a traditional printing company and starting it all over again is that it's very hard to get people on the mindset that their, their opinions actually can make a difference in, in the direction the company is going to go. So, you know, so, some of the best opportunities in, in Lean is to arrange things in a one-piece one value stream. And when we introduced Lean into RT, we were more operated by like a pretty traditional company. We had our estimating, our customer service, pre-press, press finishing for both. And, and when we looked into the processes, we decided to build it into three value streams. We had our offset digital and AMT, which is our web to print, our web to print. And we, by breaking these pieces into value streams, we were able to offer, you know, Barb talked about the seamless integration of, of workflow. It, it provided the separation in those areas. And what we did, the way we went about it was to develop these value process maps that we went through every step of the operation and identified whether it was value add or non-value add and where it fell into, in, into the cycle. And then from evaluating that data collection, we were able to determine where to, where to go with the company. So Lean has specific tools that uh, this, is a, this is a value process map or a spaghetti map that we tracked every, everywhere a job went through the entire, the, the entire shop and evaluated many types of jobs. And when we, after the process, we were able to consolidate in just that yellow square, our, our digital print, where you see how it traveled throughout the entire operation before. Um, the map al allowed us to identify how much waste was, was in the process. And from there, we built out this, this U-shaped workflow that was seamless from receiving the order all the way through shipping, and we did that for both digital offset, and then the AMT was our, our web to print part. Bob, I have a couple questions for you. What kind of volume do you get over the internet today in terms of work coming in? Um, AMT is our, our internet part of the business. That's the uh, you know, automated marketing tools. We have about 20 web to print sites, and I said that 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 probably represents only about 25% of our business, but it represents a much higher portion of orders. The orders tend to be very, very small. So one, one of the key pieces of the uh, of equipment that we added was the uh, was the Canon device that has full inline finishing, so that our web to print orders fully automated. We, we did this about oh gosh, I guess maybe six years ago is that was one of the first full JDF workflows that from order entry, imposition, all the way through billing, you know, you talked about um, the more times things are touched, we, we use Enterprise for our MIS system that all the orders go directly through there, through billing, even, even the freight or UPS is, is posted onto the finished piece and we don't touch an invoice. And at the end, we scan the job ticket that produces the, uh, the shipping log and everything. So it's fully automated. Most of the orders are probably in the area of $100, very, you know, very small compared to our other orders. But the volume makes up for it. And the, and the fact that if it wasn't automated, it probably wouldn't be a profitable business. Okay. Great. So, you know, part of... Implementing lean has to be a commitment on management side that you're going to do the, the things that come out of the data collection. And from our data, we ended up having to uh, knock down walls, re reorganize workspaces, and put people into these workflow 
value streams that allow the information to flow freely. This is a diagram that we, we actually removed several offices to put the, uh, this is a picture of our offset cell after it was, was completed and we had to fill in the carpeting there. And the things that Lean developed for us is that we set a goal of a 2% per month continuous improvement. And every cell had its productivity charge. For example, in the, in the digital cells, it was um, for the CSR area, we had number of jobs produced per day. We had number of, of impressions per man hour or, or flicks per man hour on the presses, similar types of things. And, and those were measurements that the employees could relate to and, and add to the continuous improvement part of it. Our inventory was, was real easy to, 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 to reduce the turn on that. Um, indirect labor, lean has doing more with less, and we were able to, to, to condense the space, improve the, the, the workflow that went through it, and the things that came out of it that, that probably uh, made, made most satisfaction for me is that the, the improvement for quality and then when big companies came through our shop, they saw that we had processes that they wouldn't expect in a typical shop of our size. And that's, you know, the majority of our businesses is centered around Fortune 500 companies. So um, it's, 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 I guess I, I flipped on to Peter's, <laughs> Peter's but, that's but okay. uh, you know, for, for me, it's, it's made the, uh, made my management of, of our, our team and now Sagerdahl implementing it over there much much easier because the process is that dictate the entire business plan. Um, let me let me ask uh, a couple questions that came in while, we, while you were speaking then. So when you look at your inventory turnover, how do you define that? Could you explain that to the group in terms of your your 25% uh, improvement per year? So we, we built a Kanban system. When we looked at all of our, our normal, whether they were stocks, um, supplies for the presses, or in other pieces, and we we determined what the, the the refill rate was, and we developed the these cards that would mark the inventory, and when they reached a certain spot, those cards would be turned in, faxed to the supplier, and then hung on a board so that when the materials came back in, the card would recirculate, and it was a continuous um, inventory control. And what we did from those, we would mark those, those spots onto the, com onto, the, uh, onto the card, and we would check to see if we were ordering at the right inventory levels to maintain what we needed for you know, the daily work, as well as keeping the inventory at the right level. So it, it was a, an automated process that is looked at you know occasionally when we when we turn the cards in to see how frequently we were ordering it versus the amount of time that it spent on the shelf. Okay. Now you mentioned that you integrate with your integrated with your vendors and they participated in the overall yeah. process. What kind yeah. of tools did you put in place so that they would replenish inventory well and not basically have you holding it? Okay. So um one of them with, with our paper suppliers is that, you know, when the truck rolled in, we would automatically go and, you know, use our guys to take the pieces off and, and the skids off. What we did was we established places for the orders, and we, and, and we had a box where they would pick up the orders, and they would actually put the, the skids into the proper places on the shop floor to, you know, that was work that we didn't have to do any longer, so we we pass that exercise on to onto the vendor. Another another one, you know, when the UPS truck usually pulled up, we would always, you know, go there and load it up for them and bring all the stuff to one place. Now they come into our shop and have designated pickup places and distribute the materials that we used to have to, to put our. You know, so those those were just real simple changes that took. Uh, took the labor or the, and the expense out of our process. Okay. Now, did you find that ordering and getting deliveries just in time was more costly than buying in bulk, or were the, how did the vendors treat you on that one? Because of the way we set up the ordering process, they allowed us to reduce to, you know, we were still ordering the same amount of quantity, 
but they allowed us to reduce our inventory size because we had the SKU numbers and everything else right onto the cards that we saved time in their front end process. Um, you know, and, and Barb, I guess one one of the things about um, lean that small changes make a difference. And, you know, lots of times people have these big meetings that they sit and plan and plan as to how to implement. You know, the, the thing about lean is to take on, you know, the immediate action and to just go go about doing these things. Um, one of the one of the key parts that that we found was as successful as implementing into manufacturing was getting into the into the front office. So we uh, we developed some processes around just sales submission, and there's a there's a great book out that's uh, that's called the Checklist Manifesto. It mm-hmm. talks about a lot of it's developed around medical pre- medical processes, and you know, without the checklist. We were always missing little little pieces, and now an order has to have all these pieces checked before it can submit to go through the the entire workflow, and it's it's just made things so much quicker in the sales. You know, some of the stress out of the sales operation, and certainly on the customer service part. But those, you know, if you if you look at an operation, you know, if you're going to have knee surgery and they, you go in and they circle the knee that they're going to be operating on. Some of that seems so simple that how could you mess that up? But, you know, you wouldn't get on an airplane unless the pilot had a checklist to go through every every piece, and we kind of treat an order in our shop the same way. That's great. Now, one other, one other quick question. When you take a look, one of the folks asked, when you take a look at the cost of running a job, how do you, you know, you looked at it and said, hey, you know, I got improvements in productivity, improvements in in inventory turns, you know, reductions in, in direct la- indirect labor. Um, when you look at the cost or, or the overall profitability, what was the impact on profitability of, of dealing with a specific job or jobs? Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to look on a, on a specific job, but on a monthly or a, basis. Or across the spectrum. Well, we... We we set these pieces up, and and each area had had a, had a couple of different different criteria. You know, qual, quality was defined in some areas as far as on time delivery and and waste or redos, um, turn turn time, number of impressions per per piece. But that that overall metric that we set up four years ago was two percent improvement per month, mm-hmm. and. In, in tracking that, we've still been able to maintain that for almost four years now. Wow. Okay. Great. Now, one other quick question for you before I turn it over to um, Peter. And one of the people asked, when you you talked about having you know twenty very act twenty plus active websites, how many orders are you processing? How many digital orders are you processing a month? So some of them are some of them are cyclical, but. In in a month, I would say that we're probably in the area of about six to seven hundred. Okay. And so, what you do is you basically feed those into the system. They could be large or small, but they're coming in from a number of different websites. Uh, a number of different websites in a, in a in a bunch of different ways. Some of them are um, driven through co-op dollars that the the co-op money is automatically approved through the site before the order gets to go on. Some of them are uh, credit card processed. Um, but Mm -hmm. in your earlier part of the presentation, you know, a lot of that starts out in different channels, but in the end it all has to flow through the same system. And, you know, the automation does that for us. Great. Um, now, I'm going to turn it then over to Peter, and Peter Barzak runs something that's a lot different from uh, Bob's environment. He actually is the Vice President of Operations at Data Mail, and where Bob has come from a, a, a more traditional, what I'll categorize as commercial print type environment, what Peter's doing is he's really dealing with um, a direct mail, high-end direct mail operation, so I'm going to let Peter take you through um, how they've streamlined operations and what they're doing at Data Mail. Peter, take it away. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Barb. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Barzak. I've um, actually been with Data Mail uh, about uh, 12 or 13 years or so. Uh, before that, I've spent uh, about 15 years in airspace. 
So my background is actually also in uh, process reengineering, lean uh, systems. Um, I was actually a general manager of a company in the airspace world uh, for a number of years um, before I moved into the uh, direct mail. Um, so I brought a lot of the techniques, a lot of the uh, expertise that I picked up from the a very structured uh, fortune uh, basically a Dow company um, into this uh, into the direct mail environment. So um, we do have uh, hundreds of projects at play here. So what I try to do in this presentation is give you more of an overview of data mail and basically give you kind of our um, higher level view of the company and a higher level view of what we're trying to achieve with our customer base and with our operations because I believe it is very unique in the direct mail environment. Um, we, we are a little bit different um, from Bob in, that's, uh, in that um, uh, we're dealing in very large uh, quantities, very large volume of work, um, very sophisticated work. We don't do any web to print. Um, so so let, me, let me kind of start off with the first slide here telling you a little bit about data mail. Um, data mail, um, Let's see, hold on a sec. Okay, here we go. Uh, data Mail was established in 1971. Um, it's uh, been founded by Andy and Joyce Mendel. Uh, the company has grown from very modest beginnings. As a matter of fact, it started in the garage uh, to basically one of the nation's largest volume direct mail processing, printing, letter shop, and computer services company. Um, uh, again, we've been around 40 years. We've actually celebrated a 40-year anniversary uh, last year. Um, and under the stewardship of the same family, uh, Andy Mandel, by the way, still comes to work every day. <laughs> so uh, he's still here. Um, his kids are now more involved, but uh, Andy's still around. And more than 40 years later, uh, data mail has the ability to produce now over 5 million pieces of mail every day in half a million square feet in two of its Connecticut production facilities with over 800 employees um, in many areas we're now running 24 hours by seven days a week schedules. So we're, we've actually just transitioned the last year to in many areas from three shift operation to a four shift operation. As a matter of fact, uh, we only closed, I believe, two days a year. Uh, data Mail has a client base of Fortune uh, 500 companies and major ad agencies in North America, uh, telecommunications companies, et cetera, uh, spanning a variety of sectors, as I said, from financial services to retail to telecommunications, et cetera. Um, going to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. Um, data Mail had a key establishment principle of being a full service provider for its customers. <clears throat> this key principle resulted in transforming the company to meet the rapidly changing dynamics in the direct marketing space. Um, this principle basically led Data Mail to become a highly vertically integrated company. From, uh, we do everything from sourcing paper, offset printing, converting envelopes, data processing, personalization, letter shop, commingling to web tracking and reporting. Uh, so we spin the gamut. Uh, it provides for coordination and control of complex projects, removes customer risk in terms of protecting the timeline and maximizing cost efficiency. Um, we're very customer focused. And uh, I'm, later I'm going to talk a little bit more about the multi-channel campaigns because that's kind of like the ultimate um, area where we'll get into, but uh, but this this key principle led to a lot of innovation uh, and still leads to a lot of innovation and timely adaptation of new technologies. Um, in our print services area, <clears throat> um, we do you know we do a whole variety of things, and um, we basically have. I believe at this point six web presses. We have a, a sheet fed press. Uh, we do roll to sheet, um, uh, and we just got into something called 
the envelope printing and converting. Um, and the reason we got into it, as a matter of fact, is because the recent industry mergers and consolidations prompted us to invest in envelope production, uh, keeping with our mission of protecting our clients' timely, timeline and maximizing cost efficiency. It is our clients that basically drove us to this because of the schedules that we needed to be able to deliver and the efficiency that we needed to be able to get the work done at. We actually were getting to a lot of these technologies based on that. Um, in the data center, uh, we do a lot of highly variable content programming for our clients, as well as host of high-speed data processing, one we generally see in direct mail. Recently, we set up a second pre-press area just to handle digital color. Uh, this was because we've noticed inefficiencies in trying to coordinate the fixed layer and variable layer, layer data between the data processing and offset pre-press areas. Um, we're working with such techniques as putting variable information to a picture, uh, which is something, if you can imagine that, it's like writing on a sand. We can basically modify a picture with variable data in the picture, uh, which, is, which is very cool uh, once you get to see it. Uh, we're managing and maintaining customer data, as well as give our customers compatibility and control of their mail streams from start to finish. Um, okay, we are one of the probably first in direct marketing industry uh, to adapt the high-speed continuous form digital color press. Um, it's a it's an OSE jet stream. Um, we actually have two of them. It provides for full color variable content at lower campaign cost than, than were available before. Uh, we believe that print will continue to be a critical part of any marketing campaign. Uh, the machines produce the high resolution 600 by 600 DPI, four, four over four color CMYK letter images at 500 feet per minute. Uh, which is the kind of capacity we need to be able to get the volumes we've got to get out. Um, with the with the width of 20 and a half inches, the machine can produce two WAP 8 and a half by 11 duplex pieces at a rate of 1 million pieces per day per machine. So with these two machines, we can get up to 2 million pieces per day. Uh, hey, Peter, oh, Peter, I have a quick question for you. Sure. One of the participants wanted to know, in your perspective, when you talk about doing variable data, how much volume of, you mentioned, you know, it's got the capability of doing, you know, a million pieces per machine per day. What kind of volumes are you running in, as you look at the total operation at Data Mail, what percentage of your work is variable data? Well, um, just about everything we do, um, when I say 5 million pieces of mail per day, every one of those pieces is variable data. Every okay. one of those is a variable individualized envelope uh, with highly variable data in it. The difference here is that the variable data that we used to produce until we acquired these devices, we also have, by the way, uh, one of the largest iGen or Xerox installations as well. So we produce both cut sheet and web, you know, web to web or with the web uh, roll to roll. Um, but the difference is, is that now we also uh, put variable color uh, or image uh, data on the page besides just variable black data. Okay, but but out of the you know one and a half billion pieces that we did last year, they were all variable. Okay, and, and how much of that was color variable? I would say that uh, color variable, um, we, we, we probably run on these presses about 30 to 40 percent color variable. Okay. I, I still use about 60 percent of these presses as black. Okay. Um, but we, again, we had to invest in this technology because we had the customer base. Our customers have been asking to experiment with certain things, and we're bringing on more and more customers onto this kind of technology. Okay. Um, but uh, we're about 30 to 40 percent color on these devices right now. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. No problem. Um, again, uh, the, 
there is a growing number of stocks that the machine supports for water-based dye inks is what we run on these devices. Obviously, uh, if you know anything about the inkjet, you'll know that the um, they're aqueous, or at least most of these devices uh, use aqueous inks, which means the substrate uh, is very critical. And there's a growing number of now substrates available. Uh, the original ones were very expensive, but uh, there is quite a few papers now that are becoming available that uh, have come down in price. Uh, obviously, if you run gloss or matte stocks, um, it becomes more challenging. But uh, if you're running regular offset, then um, uh, then it works. Uh, we've uh, we don't find an issue running black stocks on um, on the inkjet. Uh, I mean black ink on the inkjets uh, uh, on on matte stocks. But when it gets to color, it is more of a challenge. But as I said, there's more and more papers becoming available all the time. Great. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is the kind of um, uh, letter that would, we would produce. Um, so as you can see, marketers now have more freedom than ever to use full color within their variable data strategy. Uh, like number one, for example, on that uh, sample letter points to demographic information to drive color images and text. Okay, uh, in this case, it's a big beach scene, for example, that can vary with uh, with a specific uh, promotional page for a specific customer. Uh, we can use customized color graphs and charts, uh, which you can see with two, three, and five. Uh, which is all variable. Um, I've seen in the bonus points, offers, benefits, and special messages. Um, we can pull in customer-specific logos of affinity partners, which is number four here. As you can see, we're pulling in, um, boy, I have a small image, but it's uh, Rite Aid, uh, there's a few of them, Hilton, et cetera. Um, and while providing fully personalized information, um, number six, uh, we have a salutation that is obviously variable, and we also have registration codes, foreign phone numbers, and QR codes, which I'll talk about the importance of uh, a little bit later. Does everybody know what a QR code? Well, QR code is a quick response code. So basically by uh, um, scanning the QR code, uh, you're able, with your phone, for example, with your cell phone, you're able to get exactly to the to the page that the particular uh, promotion wants you to drive to, wants you want you to get to. Okay. Uh, in this case, sample letter two, um, the customers, in the example, our customers use past buying history to target offers, and the selection of merchant partners for the promotion. Again, it's a very personalized piece with variable reservation codes, phone number, QR codes. Uh, as you can see, each one of these letters is very different um, and is specifically designed for a customer. Let me ask, I have one other question. So I've got very, very complex applications. How do I streamline getting my data in, getting it printed, and then getting it out the door in an envelope to the right person. Well, and actually, where are there, are there bar, what barcoding mechanisms and those kind of things do you have in place? Um, well, actually, you have both the QR codes and you have URLs. Um, so, uh, in every one of these pieces, I don't know if you can see it because the image is so small. But uh, you have uh, many, many things. You have uh, URLs that you can specifically put into place to get into a certain page. The QR code will take you to a certain page, uh, maybe even for that specific uh, customer. Um, everything here is absolutely variable. Everything that is in these yeah. boxes are absolutely variable. It could be variable down to a specific promotion, or it could be variable down to a specific uh, customer. Later, I'm going to talk about our data processing strategy, which okay. I think is a good year. Um, okay. Um, okay, letter shop services. Um, obviously, we have a full uh, letter shop uh, capability. Uh, 
being in high volume direct marketing space, uh, Data Mail is always looking for ways to increase their production throughput. Um, in a letter shop, that just means faster, flexible equipment and combining processes to improve efficiency and material flows. Uh, this is one of those areas we're continuously developing in. Uh, I was just a graph expo, and I go to every one of those, and we we always get some ideas back. And um, as a matter of fact, and we have a lot of these vendors that come to see us all the time, and a lot of the technology they see out there, a uh, number of it has been prototyped and developed in our facility. Um, one of them, for example, is a flexible setup of a production line that is running at 500 feet a minute, cutting, card affixing, folding, gluing, uh, and sorting mail, okay, with uh, one or two operators. That's running at 500 feet a minute. So um, in this case, the next step is to add personalization, and we basically have everything except the offset printing um, in that one step. So we're constantly improving in this area for us to be able to get the kind of efficiencies and to get the kind of volume we're looking to get to and grow. We always need to improve in this area. We've gone a long ways even in the last 10 years that I've been in the company in this area. Um, email. Um, now, what makes the multi-channel campaign work effectively at data mail, and I'm going to talk about multi-channel the next slide, is basically that we have one common workflow. Okay, Whether it goes on form or email, uh, it is the same variable coding that pulls the same data file and rules matrix. The same auditing is performed. And the only last few steps are the ones that differ. Okay. To give you an idea, we're doing campaigns where we would have a three-inch binder. Um, literally, three inches of paper would be describing the, the rules that we would have to follow to be able to code a certain promotion. Uh, so they're very sophisticated promotions. We have quite a bit of programming tied into it. And for us to be able to go from a uh, print and letter com campaign to the email campaign is basically the same difference. At the end of the day, it's just a matter where we flow the uh, where we flow the information, and we do do both. We do do both. Okay. Um, the next slide is kind of like the the slide that's uh, called to, you know uh, where things come together um, with. With this fully variable color and high capacity print capability, data mail synchronizes direct mail, email, and text campaigns. Um, we work with clients to integrate personalized URLs and QR codes to connect with the web. We capture response information and provide real-time campaign effectiveness tracking. Um, Therefore, our clients can basically leverage their creative assets and rule-based logic into efficient multi-channel campaigns. Um, and I think that's the key, is the ability to combine uh, all of the above. You know, So we're able to take it all the way from the idea, which is coming from the advertising agency. We take uh, clients' data, and we take it all the way to the end, all the way through production, all the way through uh, tracking information and uh, providing analysis on the effectiveness, et cetera. Okay, I think that's pretty much uh, all I have. Well, I have a few questions for you. The first one is um, what software tools um, are you using to, to A, manage the variable data side, and then B, produce 5 million pieces of mail a day? Well, um, when you mean by software, there, there, is, um, um, there is the software to do the actual uh, data crunching that happens in the front end to basically prepare the variable data, uh -huh. um, you know, and prepare the letters, and then there is actually manage the uh, shop floor as the production is uh, and then there is the tracking software at the end of the day that basically tracks the mail through the through the process. Um, all of these are kind of like different. Um, so, uh, different. what would you use on the front end for the data crunching? For the data crunching, um, to create a letter, 
uh, well, I don't know if I should give, if I should go into specific names, but uh, we do use a whole suite of uh, GMC products to okay. create. Uh, we use Group One uh, suite of products for uh, for basically any kind of postal data processing. Okay. Uh, we do pre-sort. We do. Uh, delivery point validation, we do CAS, we do web track, we do okay. um, intelligent mail barcode support. Uh, the, there is a whole variety of software. Our data processing department is approximately uh, 50 people. Okay. So, um, so there is a significant front end to make all this yep. work. And it's the same front end for both the uh, the print as well as the email um, campaigns, so that's important. Okay. And are there any special software tools that you use to manage and track the jobs as they flow through your production facility, um, or is that homegrown? Have, yeah, there's probably things you can. I know I've seen things that are available there commercially that you can buy, but we found that uh, we kind of. Because we had to do it uh, because of our volumes and because of, um, you know, trying to manage what was going on on the floor, we kind of also fell into the situation of violence of automation, and we basically developed some of the code ourselves in-house to be able to manage it all the way from, you know, through various areas. We have our own quality system. We have our own uh, letter chef tracking system. Uh, we, have, we have our own uh, planning um, we have our own uh, recap or a traveler. Um, all these things, we have our own quoting process system. So we, we've developed kind of our own systems in order to be able okay. to manage the whole thing through. But we, we are actually in process um, as we speak to implement, um, r try to kind of combine all these islands into an ERP system that would basically combine these islands and reduce some of the inefficiencies of having to maintain information, you know, or retype information more than once and maintain it in more than one uh, place. Okay. So uh, we are in the process of doing that. Okay. Now I have a question for Bob, and then I've got a question for both of you. Um, Bob, and you mentioned that you had a lot of web-to-print sites. Did you – Are was the actual sites that you – the sites that you developed, were they homegrown, or did you use a set of software tools? I think Bob might have muted me. I, did I? <laughs> I, I think you might have muted me, Bob. Can I, you hear I, me was now? Just, I was just, yeah, I can hear you now. Um, okay. I was just I, checking. I heard the question. Yeah. yeah. Did you, did you, were, were the websites homegrown, or did you, um, did you develop those? We um, we bought tools or engines, and then we developed quite a bit of integration around them. So some of the inter interfacing with um, co-op dollars, um, almost all of them have single points of sign on that we had to develop some of those those tools. But the majority of it is is off the shelf software. Okay, and would you mind the would you mind sharing what tools you did use? We started out with um, a couple of them that weren't too successful, and then we ended up with Sapio for about four or five years, and then they kind of went more the course of campaign management. So recently we switched about a year ago to OPS software. Okay, great, thanks. Now, uh, one, of, one of the things that I would add as far as getting into that is, is that once you get started with some companies that put quite a few assets on, the cost of switching becomes very expensive. Okay. Okay. Now, the next question I have is one for both of you. You've obviously both got streamlined workflows and you're continuing to invest in automation. I'll start with you, Bob. It, when you look at the fact that, you know, your productivity is improving 2% per month, where is that improvement coming from in terms of the reengineered processes that you've got? Is there specific areas that you've seen that have major contribution? The, uh, the biggest contribution is, is, believe it or not, has come more from the front end. You know, the, the people, the, the people involved in that, and you know, 
again, let's talk about non-value added processes is that, you know, people want their, their print, the, the right print order executed, but the, you know, writing up that order and executing those processes is really non-value add time. And the fact that there is so much waste in the office and just as far as standard work and how it's performed, that's where we realize the biggest benefit. Okay. And and when you take a look at, at your business, Peter, and you look at, you know, the fact that you've got tools and you're starting to integrate those islands of automation, where do you see increased profits actually coming from? Well, the um, – uh, I would say in um, – in couple of areas. I, I think one big area is that we get involved with the customer in the original uh, design of the, the the artwork, for example. We take the artwork and we lay it out on a piece of paper and we come up with the most creative way of uh, being able to run it most efficiently through the entire process. Um, so we would um, save money on paper, save money on um, on cutting and folding and the, the entire back-end process on the personalization costs, et cetera. So I think working with the customer from the very beginning um, and laying things out uh, appropriately, I think, is the kind of like the biggest um, savings. Um, okay. There's definitely a right and a wrong way to run something, um, and we see the biggest savings there. Uh, however, but internally, cost-wise, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of, we we're trying to reduce our overhead. So one of the ways to reduce the overhead is to eliminate this uh, duplication of effort that happens uh, throughout various companies. And to us, it's even more than just the duplication of effort. It is the time that it would take us to get something, you know, to get through the system. Uh, we're very conscious of how long it takes us to get from the order to the shipment, I mean, to the okay. to the realization of that order and try to reduce that time is, by default, is going to get us uh, um, a lot more efficient. Okay. And then one last question of you, Peter, and that is um, you, you say you do a lot of work on tracking. Do you track the effectiveness of the campaigns for your clients? Yes, we do. Uh, and for, for and then – we do. I wouldn't say for 100%, but for some clients we do. Okay. And we like to do more of that. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you, then I've got three questions that link to that. The first one is, have you seen improved response rates for clients when they use high-speed inkjet with color? Um, I, I can't talk directly to that because I haven't, you know, I haven't, um, I haven't been privy to a lot of this data. I mean, okay. we do track it. We do provide it to the customers, but I'm I'm not sure if I've uh, if I can tell you for sure. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm being told that's the case, but you know yeah. I have I haven't personally I cannot personally tell you that that's the case. Okay, uh, and then if you know what I mean, I just do you uh, have any? We, it, qu quick question that links that. Do you have any tracking on the effectiveness of QR codes or pearls in campaigns that you've done? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, the response rates, um, once we put the, uh, the – there's no question about that. The, um, the URLs and QR codes are helping to drive the customer to where, uh, where we want them to go to get to the, uh, to the landing pages on, you know, okay. on the Internet, and they, you know, they get to the you – know, it, it makes the whole thing work together, which okay. is uh, – yeah, as a matter of fact, we have campaigns that involve the entire gamut. So it definitely links the whole thing together. You're talking okay. about a more, you know, very sophisticated customer. You're talking about a very sophisticated campaign, but, um, you know, they obviously get results. So. Okay. Um, just a couple of, of quick wrap-up comments because we're getting to the top of the hour. First, I want to start by thanking both Bob and Peter for some great insight on the importance of automation. And, and I think what you're hearing is you've got Peter who's doing, you know, 5 million jobs a month. You've got Bob who's successfully and effectively um, implemented a lean manufacturing process and basically, you know, that 2% productivity improvement per month. 
and so the simple message I think that they're both giving you is that automation is, is really critical to maintaining economic equilibrium. And there's a clear set of advantages ranging from error, error reduction to the overall ability to get more through the floor. And so what you've got is you've got an environment that we're all dealing with where efficiency really does become everything, and it's, it's all about doing more with less in today's market. And if I've got that ability to do more with less, I'm going to save money. I've got the ability to drive incremental revenue, operational efficiency. I can reduce my staffing requirements, and I can optimize my overall return on investment. And so – I kind of am getting back to where I started, which is I think what you've got are both Bob and Peter that are doing the right thing in terms of the services portfolio that they're offering to their customer, but they're also doing the thing right by making sure that they're operationally excellent. And I'd like to thank everybody as well as both Bob and Peter for joining us today. I'd like to thank uh, OSE for sponsoring the webinar, and I'd be delighted if you would take a few minutes to fill out a feedback survey. And again, you'll be able to go to the website and download the, the slides from today's webinar. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your time and attention, and we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Have a great rest of the day.